Hello, I'm Megan Bryan's Deputy Director of Fundraising Supporter Development, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to today's event, Our Scientists, Our New Superheroes. We will shortly hear from our featured guest, Professor Michael Levitt, and your, your fellow alumnus. But before then, the Vice President and Vice Principal of King's International will be sharing some news from King's. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce King's Professor, Professor, Professor Funmi Alonashokan. Thanks, Megan. Uh, let me welcome uh, our alumni and students uh, to today's events. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I wanted to start by giving you a picture of how Kings uh, is faring in this post-Brexit UK and uh, if you like mid-global pandemic world. Uh, of course, these are uncertain times uh, for all of us, uh, but I'm pleased to report that Kings is continuing to deliver world-class teaching, research and impact and living up to its continued you know, position uh, as one of the top 10 UK universities in the world. Uh, if you look at our QS world rankings, um, we're continuing to do well. Uh, only a couple of days ago, uh, we learned that we are 11th in the world uh, for social and environmental impact uh, in the Times Higher Education uh, University impact rankings. We're delighted um, uh, about this. We continue to do well uh, in this uh, particular area. Uh, but just to share a few highlights, uh, the King's Leadership, uh, Civic Leadership Academy, uh, and a year-long communications campaign to bring to public attention uh, the health impacts of air pollution uh, have each won a Guardian University Award. We're delighted about this. Um, this award celebrates inspirational and groundbreaking projects uh, from UK universities. Um, in February uh, last year, 2020, King's was named the first Refugees Welcome University uh, by community organizing charity Citizens in the UK. Uh, as part of our commitment to support refugees, King's has been working with the Home Office and the United Nations uh, Refugee Agency, UNHCR, uh, to become the first university to be accredited as a community sponsor. And this is as part of the UK uh, Refugee Community Sponsorship Scheme. Uh, once this is fully approved, we will resettle uh, a vulnerable refugee family who have been identified by uh, UNHCR on the basis of their protection need. We're very proud uh, to be uh, able to do this. Um, now, as far as our physical spaces uh, are concerned, there are several uh, exciting changes happening. And just in headline form, uh, we have the PES mostly Center for Children and Young People, uh, which will be uh, unique. Uh, an innovative, uh, to be an innovative space in Denmark Hill. It, will, it is designed to improve mental health for the youngest and most vulnerable members uh, of our population. Uh, the center is so innovative. Uh, it's the only one of its kind in the UK, which will bring world-class clinical services, research, education and outreach to improve children and young people's mental health uh, and life outcomes. Uh, the construction of this uh, center will begin this spring and the space is due to open in 2023. We very much look forward uh, to that. Now to the Strand Campus, uh, we, it will also look quite different uh, the next time you visit perhaps. Uh, the first change is the development of the quad. I, I think you've seen that in the video um, uh, earlier on a, a few minutes ago. The quad space between King's Building and Somerset House uh, is being developed and this will modernize uh, and I dare say, uh, beautify uh, the ground level uh, space, as well as providing engineering research laboratories and teaching spaces for the reintroduced engineering programs in the sub-ground level. Uh, this will happen in tandem with the Strand uh, Aldwych project, which will pedestrianize uh, the road between Somerset House and Bush House, creating a more, uh, you know, campus feel right in the heart of London. And we very much look forward to showing you these improved spaces uh, at the next opportunity. Now to tonight's uh, theme, we're continuing to educate the superheroes of tomorrow uh, through science at King's. We've reintroduced and, and expanded our engineering activity at King's, as I mentioned earlier, in both teaching and research. And some of the greatest advances are being made in the fields, in fields such as robotics, 
uh, biomedicine and informatics. These trends in interdisciplinary science were of course uh, evident in King's COVID uh, response. You would have seen some of our earlier um, announcements on this to the alumni community. Uh, as a medical research uh, facility with a proud history of service uh, to our community, we also had the desire and duty to put ourselves at the center uh, of, that, of that response. Our community has so far given uh, more than 1.2 million pounds uh, through our COVID-19 fundraising appeal. And thanks to that support, we have been able to fund research into the treatment of COVID-19, including creating an NHS accredited uh, COVID-19 diagnostic center. Uh, we fund initiatives to assist uh, developing countries in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, we support students facing financial hardship as a result of the coronavirus. We have all of you to thank for this. Uh, as further testament uh, to King's pivotal role in the COVID, re uh, COVID response, we're very proud to announce that King's professor, Lucy Chapel, has just been appointed as the next chief scientific advisor uh, for the Department of Health and Social Care, uh, a crucial role uh, in a post-COVID Britain. Uh, so now King's, like so many institutions, has adapted to the new reality that COVID-19 has heralded. And while we continue to provide, provide world-class education and transformational research in a new environment, our proud history of serving the community means that we're confident that our global family will be up to the task uh, of the challenges ahead. Um, on this question, we say that we, we talk about this all the time, get involved and give back. Uh, our global alumni community uh, is really important to us. So thinking of the future, we're hoping to return to in-person teaching as soon as it is safe to do so. And in the meantime, our alumni are even more important than ever to help ensure our remote learning uh, students are connected to King's communities in the UK and around the world. Thank you so much uh, to all of you who have hosted and met with King students and participated uh, in events such as the King's Let's Chat series uh, in recent months. This has been really uh, important to our students, particularly our international students uh, that uh, haven't made it back to Kings uh, in, in a while. So there are of course so many more ways to get involved with this vibrant uh, alumni community. Please join the 15,000 alumni and students uh, on Kings Connect, uh, the online mentoring platform, uh, which many of you have visited help recruit the next generation of King students by supporting student recruitment. Uh, get involved with the original alumni activities, and many of you do that already. And to learn more about these activities, details will be uh, in a follow-up email after tonight, um, uh, after today's event. So as you can see, uh, there are lots of opportunities to get involved. Uh, you, you make the King's community stronger, and we hope that you will lend your expertise to students and your fellow alumni. We truly appreciate uh, what you do. Uh, one final bit of news. Um, it's about uh, Professor Shitish Kapoor, uh, who's, of course, uh, it's been announced that he will be joining Kings as a new president and principal. And um, before I hand over uh, this event, I wanted to say a bit about uh, this. Professor Kapoor is well known as King, at King's, having already previously served as Dean and Head of School for the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, which you know uh, as IOPPN, it's a faculty, uh, of course, and he was Assistant Principal uh, for Academic Performance. He will return to King's, uh, we're delighted to say, uh, as President and Principal in June 2021, uh, following more than four years uh, at the University of Melbourne, where he was Dean and Assistant Vice Chancellor for Health uh, for the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. He looks forward to meeting you at future alumni and university events. Uh, finally, uh, now to our speakers this evening, it's my uh, singular honor uh, to introduce Nobel Laureate uh, and one of King's most eminent alumni, uh, Professor Michael Levitt, uh, who will be in conversation with our own uh, King's professor, Sir Robert Leckler. And I want to say, uh, until recently, he was a change-making uh, provost and senior vice president for health at King's. It's my great pleasure uh, to welcome them both. I will now hand over to Robert to start the conversation. Uh, our scientists, uh, our new superheroes is the title of today's 
uh, talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Fungmi. Um, so can I just add my welcome to everybody who's online? It's great that you were able to take time out um, during your working hours to join us. And I'm absolutely delighted to be spending some time in conversation uh, with Michael Levitt, who I've not had the pleasure of meeting face to face, but uh, I think we're going to get to know each other uh, better over the next hour. So Michael, thank you very, very much for uh, making time for this, because I know you're charging around China doing all sorts of important things, but it's really nice to have you um, to ourselves for uh, an hour. Maybe to get the conversation started, it would be great to hear from you a brief summary of your career. Um, and perhaps if you could include in that, it's a bit of a tough ask, but I'm sure you've done this many times, a thumbnail sketch, a layman's summary of what your Nobel Prize winning work uh, was about. Great, Robert. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, um, I actually came to King's when I was 17 uh, from South Africa, where I'd been born and studied, uh, did my physics degree there, then went uh, to Israel for a year, then to Cambridge to do a PhD. And since then, I've had faculty appointments in the UK, in Israel, in the United States. Um, the Nobel Prize actually was a surprise, and it's quite nice that it's a surprise because there are many people who every, no, every October sort of sit around the TV and are disappointed. So it was a, a great surprise. The prize was really for work that I got interested in at King's in 1967. Um, and essentially it's biophysics, uh, an area that was very, very strong at King's at the time. Uh, but unlike DNA, which uh, Wilkins had done at King's, Ross and Franken, it concerns um, a more general approach to any structure where instead of building physical models, you would build computer models. Um, nowadays, computer models seem absolutely obvious. We use them for almost everything, including the weather. But back then, it wasn't clear how you'd model these large molecules, but it turned out uh, it was actually something that I did immediately after leaving King's. I had a year, like an, a gap year in Israel before starting my PhD in Cambridge. And, uh, you know, we were, I guess, lucky and to be in the right place at the right time. And these computer models have become uh, increasingly important uh, as we realize that biology is sort of like clockwork. It's very precise, little, bit, little machines that interact together. And these machines are mostly uh, proteins. So, so everything that is done in the body is basically orchestrated by proteins. And essentially my area has been to try to understand how proteins move and how they function. Super, well, that was really clear and accessible. Thank you very much for that. Um, anybody who's been to the Strand campus recently, I, I don't know when you were there yourself uh, last, Michael, but uh, they'll have seen your picture uh, so we have a series of pictures on the strand of our distinguished alumni and you are there you'll be pleased to know so what what was the last time you were at king's actually and, and what do you remember most about your time there as, as an undergraduate because it's a long so, time so uh actually i was in london uh in, in the last august and we actually stayed very near king's uh in in covent garden so we actually did go along a very deserted strand uh, to see the pictures. In fact, London was actually very sad then because all the theaters still had their lights on and the posters and uh, there were an awful lot of homeless people. And also a very cold October, um, August. My mother lives in London. She's 106 years old. So we came to London to see her. One of our first trips during the Corona season. Uh, so I did see my picture. Kings, I remember, I think most strongly the diversity. I had been, I'd grown up in South Africa and I remember one of my first friends in, at King's was a, probably a fellow physics student from Uganda. But very quickly, I suddenly had a, a range of friends extending from all over the world. And it made me realize that diversity is really the secret of life. And it's something which I become increasingly convinced of that uh, you know, life is all about diversity and not about fitness. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it was a very, very strong memory. Yeah, no, that's very nice to hear. And I think um, King's today is probably even more diverse than it was uh, in your day. And of course it's grown enormously because it's grown a huge presence in biomedicine south of the river that wasn't 
uh, a big feature at your time. Um, I should say, uh, by the way, to the audience that uh, we're very keen to um, uh, field some of your questions um, to Michael. And so um, I think if you add those in the Q&A uh, function uh, on Zoom, then we'll try and pick those up uh, towards the end uh, of the hour. Um, so structural biology, how did you get into COVID? I guess there's a kind of connection because of modeling, but... Um, how, it actually, the actually not. Of your the, brain the connection not. comes from the fact that my, my wife is a curator of Chinese photography. So we had been in China a few times before the uh, pandemic started. And she just wrote to her friends through the Chinese equivalent of WhatsApp, which is called WeChat, and basically said to them that, you know, we know there's a pandemic in Wuhan and we're, we're, we're with them. We're aware of their situation. And the response was amazing. I mean, they really loved what she had done and this response. I sort of thought, well, gee, if she can get such a response from, you know, a pretty email, I should actually start looking at the pandemic. This is around 24th or 25th of January. So it was just starting. I remember starting to say, well, is it really like SARS uh, you know, 2003? And very quickly saw that SARS 2003 was a very different disease that uh, really had a much, much higher uh, lethality. So I started studying uh, COVID. And then what happened is, is I sent a PDF file of two pages uh, to our WeChat friends and to people by email. I got into a flight, and this was right at the uh, end of January to fly to New York, and somebody had taken my report, had it translated into Chinese and leaked it onto WeChat, and it had gotten two million views within the... Two million views is not a big number in China. It's, it's a, a small number. You have to scale everything by a factor of a thousand or something. Uh, so I suddenly realized that I was committed. I actually, basically in this report, I'd said that it looked to me that the pandemic in China was sort of, had the brakes on, it was sort of losing uh, speed. So then I started to study it and I got more and more interested. And then uh, we had other events happening like Italy and Iran and the Diamond Princess. And the data analysis was incredibly fascinating. Uh, the, you know, I, what I really do on the computer is to analyze data. So I have a, a great attraction to data and it just kept on going. The trouble is that it's now been going on for, I think, 460 days. And it's kind of tiring, but it keeps on being interesting. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, it's a very different kind of science. Mostly when you publish a paper, if you get 20 views in the next year, you're doing well. <laughs> and uh, suddenly one is now doing something that is much more relevant. Um, and I think, in fact, a very, very difficult problem. I think the one thing I would say about COVID is it's probably the hardest problem I've ever encountered and I've worked on some pretty tough problems. Yeah, no, well, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, perhaps if we get a little bit into uh, the relationship between science and politics, um, and it sort of relates to the title of this conversation, which is about scientists as superheroes. Um, there has been um, uh, a little bit of a wave of populist leadership in some countries around the world, and maybe that would apply to your adopted country in the US until recently, um, but Trump was not alone. And some of those populist leaders have, have rather questioned the value and the role of experts. I wonder what you think as we begin to emerge, and by, of course this pandemic is by no means over if we're watching what's going on in India, for example, but as we look ahead, um, do you think COVID has changed the public perception of scientists and their relationship with uh, politics? Um, it's really hard to know what the public thinks. I have almost 100,000 Twitter followers and they think all kinds of different things. So, uh, you know, I, I, um, I think the, the key thing is as though that uh, I don't see a solution to an epidemic that doesn't involve science. The trouble is, is that the science uh, is unknown and there's, there's a tendency, I think always, uh, you know, bad news travels much more quickly than good news. And uh, in general, I think even more specifically, People prefer to be pessimistic because that way you are encouraged when something good happens. So it's actually much better to say, oh my God, I've, you know, I've lost everything. And then, oh no, I just found the file. 
uh, rather than say, oh, I'm sure it doesn't matter and then discover you've lost it. So I think there's an asymmetry here uh, where we basically like to hear bad news, although we don't actually say so. We certainly don't like to hear good news. And the trouble has been that in the, in, certainly in the early days and the lack of really precise data, it's been very difficult to actually know, uh, you know, firstly, how serious COVID is, what is the actual extent of damage that's been done? How does it compare to other things that we've gone through like very serious flu pandemics? Uh, what is the amount of COVID death compared to the normal death that people go through? I think the, the thing I saw is, is that as a scientist, you always want to set backgrounds. So if somebody says a hundred people died, you'd like to ask, well, you know, how many died yesterday or how many, what is the total number that die? And I remember very early on realizing that in the world, 150,000 people die every day. And, you know, you, you don't say that glibly because every single person who dies is an enormous tragedy. But unfortunately, dying is very much part of life. So you need to continually bring in controls. I, I think that uh, what really worries me, I think, for the future is that we're going to have other problems like this, global problems where we don't know the answer. Uh, the one that is most obvious is global warming, or at least climate change. And we're going to have to make hard decisions. And I fear that the sort of uh, tendency that I re already referred to, you know, bad news troubles more than good news, people prefer to hear bad things, uh, is actually going to be a problem. Because I think, ultimately, one has to make scientific judgments. The, the real difficulty of COVID is that um, we have no treatment for COVID that is without a price. So you, let's say we decide to isolate people of a certain age, that has a price. If we decide to close schools, that has a price. If we decide to limit international trade, that has a price. So everything that would seem like something that we could do has a price. And it's incredibly important to know what the price is, because if you're trying to decide between A and B, and you've uh, got the price of A wrong by a factor of 10, say too high, then you'll only worry about A and not worry about B. So I think um, when it comes, you know, when it comes to our perception, we would rather have bad news followed mm. by good news. Mm. But if you're trying to estimate the price of something, it's really important to have an, an accurate estimate. And if the estimate is 10% too low or 10% too high, those are both equally good estimates. It's not like saying, well, we can err on the side of, uh, you know, we can say this is 100 times worse than it really is. But if you're trying to balance that against something else, you can't. And I think this has been the bottom line. I think that science is very specialized. And, uh, you know, I am not an epidemiologist. I would say I've, you know, never wanted to be one. But I do understand numbers. And I do know that, you know, if you talk about something, you need to have built in background material all the time. And uh, I think that we haven't really done this enough. I think there was also, you know, you were saying about uh, government and you mentioned Trump. Well, I should say that I actually also have British citizenship and Israeli citizenship. And if you you know, think about the leaders in all those countries, um, you know, they, they, they certainly use the pandemic in interesting ways. Um, so I think that uh, it still is very unclear what is the actual extent of damage that COVID has caused as a disease. It's also unclear what the economic damage has been, what is the school damage, what is the long-term health damage. Um, mm. Often when I'm really depressed, I say that whatever the damage is, it's probably no more than one day of the Second World War, maybe five days of the Second World War. And it seems that society needs these kinds of resets not the word that I really want to use, but world wars and you know, great depressions have a way of resetting things. And as resets go, this has been a really inexpensive one. Uh, so I guess uh, there's some, I, I don't really see the need for reset. I kind of like the world as it was before. Uh, but if you want to do a reset, this is way better than a world war or a massive, massive recession and so on. So I think there is some optimism there, but you know, I think the real thing to focus on is you know, how do we do better next time? I think that this is the, and this is actually very hard. These, these are not, but I do also think that there was a lot of fear. A lot of scientists were, a lot of people were very scared. But the scientists were also very scared. And they were very frightened uh, that people would advocate doing things that weren't strict enough, even if they would cause a, a lot of damage. But I do think we need to learn 
but difficult problems to have a lot of discussion. All discussion should be okay. It should be perfectly fine to raise the issue about how efficacious are masks, not so that you shouldn't wear masks, but let's, you know, I've almost fallen down the stairs three or four times wearing a mask. And, and I'm not saying that I, you know, I, on the other hand, when it's a cold winter, it's really nice to wear a face mask. It sort of makes you feel much warmer. But I think it's something which we need to be able to discuss. There should be no, uh, you know, places where you don't go. And unfortunately, we've seen that. So I think the real important thing to do right now is to think about how we could do better next time. Um, I think what's been done has been done. And I'm not somebody who wants to uh, blame people for what they've done. I think there's been plenty of reasons to do what's been done. Uh, but getting it right next time is going to be very important. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if I could, I mean, my reflections on, on the impact that this has had on the perception of science in the UK, um, I think laboratory scientists have come out of this smelling of roses. I mean, I think the UK has put it in a fantastic turn, um, not least with the, what I would prefer to call the Oxford rather than the AstraZeneca vaccine, but the adenoviral vaccine, which is basically safe. I mean, one in 250,000, as a complication, it's pretty good safety profile. It's effective, it's user-friendly, you can store it uh, at room temperature, it's cheap. So I think that's a huge contribution. And, and we've sequenced more viral genomes than any other country, I think. Um, and that's been a contribution, picking up variants, and we've done some great trials. So that's all ter terrific. I think the, the area of modeling epidemiology and, and so on, I think, I hope what the public have learned there is that there is no such thing as the science. I, I mean, there are differences of views and, and models come up with different answers. And, and uh, you, I think, um, contributed to that yourself. So these are really complicated issues, but surely, as you say, there's a lot to learn because the international comparisons are so, so different. I mean, and, and a simplified view is that the, country, the closer you were to SARS, uh, the better you manage this, um, different as this is from SARS, but, you know, South Korea, Vietnam, Taiwan, I mean, China, um, the, the, whether you talk about total death rate or excess deaths or whatever metric you use, they've done a great deal better than the UK and the US. Would you accept that sort of? I would accept that. I think the, you know, there are a couple of puzzles that, that extend beyond uh, COVID. I think the, how well, I call it the East Asian sector, which is like a, a slice of the earth as an orange going all the way from North Korea down to New Zealand. Uh, that whole sector has done remarkably well. I think that uh, if you look at uh, countries like, you know, one trouble with all this data is you don't have the data everywhere. So in, in some ways you really have to sort of look under the, under the lamp rather on the, under the street light rather than when you are. But, uh, in countries in that area where we actually have good data, and they include uh, South Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand, and Australia, there's actually been a massive saving of life during the COVID pandemic. And if you translate this to China, which I see no reason why it shouldn't translate to China, we're probably going to end up saving a million people in the East Asian sector. Now, that might sound like a wonderful idea, but these are people who would have succumbed to respiratory diseases like flu. Yeah. Flu went away. And now if you really think about it from those countries' problem, they're going to have excess death next year. They're going to have a lot of old, frail people. Yeah. So maybe yeah. this isn't such a good thing. Uh, the other side of the coin is, uh, you know, the, the other countries. And I think that uh, one thing that I found, which I found quite surprising, I just found it today. Uh, and that is that if we take countries and we make them all the same size, we normalize you know, say that the country has 10 million people or a million people, so everything is by a million people. And then you look at what is the best predictor of the actual excess death, which is a predictor of the cost of the COVID year. It doesn't, you don't really know why people have died, but it doesn't depend on any medical classification. It's just that in a certain year, we've had extra deaths. So though extra deaths in a country are best correlated with child mortality, so those countries that have low child mortality have low excess death. It's not correlated. I and mean, you might have thought, well, that's strange. You might have thought, for example, that the excess death, which is mainly old people, should be correlated to the mortality of old people. It's not. So it's almost like saying, you know, child, countries, if you like, countries worry about their, cho their children's death. I mean, that's a, it's a very important measure. 
But if you, you look at 39 European countries, there's a correlation coefficient of almost 0.7 between uh, mortality for people under 15. Again, you have age ranges, you have to not to 15 versus total excess death. So that surprised me. Uh, there are other interactions that deal with uh, obesity. Mm. BMI maps correlate well. Um, I, I think we still, uh, and then we occasionally have, you know, standout examples uh, in Europe. Uh, the country that really seems to have got out of this completely scot-free is not Norway or Finland or Sweden that are often quoted, it's Germany. Germany has excess death of 1% since uh, COVID has started. In Germany, the flu of 2017-18 is definitely worse than COVID. Mm. Um, and, you know, Germany is surrounded on all sides by countries that did badly. So, uh, a puzzle. Um, plus, you know, there was travel. We actually went to Germany after we'd been in England last year. We were never tested. We were, you know, no problem. So I, I, I don't think we know these things, but I think, um, you know, there may be things related to whether hospital, hospital beds are being reduced. Almost everywhere in the world, hospital beds have been reduced. Uh, because, and then this is an interesting, you know, one, one funny thing about these global phenomena is that unintended consequences of, of, of occur, reoccur all the time. So uh, I think we would all agree that we've had relatively mild winters in, northern, in the northern part of the world for the last five years, say. As a result, flu has been less deadly. Because flu has been less deadly, the uh, IC, the intensive care units have not filled up during the winter. As a result, economists have reduced numbers of beds. Uh, and, you know, it's perfectly logical. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I think Germany was one of the countries where this didn't happen. So I think there are many, many things. Unfortunately, right now, uh, you know, except for what you really mentioned about uh, uh, certain regions of the world, uh, countries behave very differently, um, you know, and yet they ended up in very similar places. Yeah. No, well, I mean, you make a very important point about... Um, resilience of healthcare systems and, and beds. Um, I mean, the, the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, tends to boast about the fact that it's 95% occupied. Now that's not a virtue, I think, that's a risk. Because if something like this happens, then uh, you really are in difficulty. So, so t let's turn to a, a bit of a forward look. I mean, uh, and if you can be sure of one thing, uh, I think it is that there will be another pandemic um, sooner or later of some sort. So, so what, what do you think um, are some of the learnings that if you were talking to um, Boris Johnson or, or, or the Secretary of State for Health, you'd say, look, guys, here are some really important things that you need to do in order to be in a better state of readiness. Because I think the truth of the matter is that we were in the UK, we were caught short. And I think part of the reason is we were dominated by a flu mentality. We just sort of, we'd done a pandemic readiness uh, sort of um, simulation, but it was all about flu. Yeah, I, I think firstly, you know, if we want to look at the worst place in the world for COVID, there's one place that stands out probably by a factor of three or four, and that's New York City. New York City in its worst week had, seven times normal weekly death. In England, in the worst week, it was double. So if you like, New York was three and a half times worse. Now, again, if you took a city, it's not really fair to compare a country to a city, uh, but uh, basically it, it's all self-consistent because you compare how bad it was in its worst week with, with its normal worst week. Uh, what happened to New York was my guess is that everyone wasn't infected before they even knew they had it. And I think the difficulty with the disease is, is that um, by the time, okay, let's just imagine you have a, a country that isn't expecting anything. Uh, the first thing you're going to know is when somebody dies, uh, because you're not going to really pay it. And maybe you need three people to die before your health system says, gee, this is strange. And then maybe you start to test. But the trouble is, is you can't test people all the time. And I mean, if, you know, it, it, if, if you could do, let's say, the uh, RNA PCR test on a daily basis for your whole country, besides the cost, the disruption would be unbelievable. So I think one needs to realize that there are rapid spreading events. And uh, when I look at China, um, 
China managed to control COVID remarkably, not only in uh, Wuhan and the province of Hubei, but in all the rest of the China, because before they realized that they actually uh, needed to shut down Hubei, a couple of million people got out carrying the, the virus with them. And there are two things about China that stand out, and it's, it's not welding door shut. I don't think that really helps at all. Uh, it's if you think about a person in home, and let's say somebody stays at home, so he can get water, he can get electricity, he can even get the internet, what he can't get is food. And what happens in China is that most people live in kind of like community living, even, even very high-end apartments uh, are closed. And it's very, very easy therefore to organize central food purchasing. In addition, uh, online payments uh, have been completely normal. I mean, you can go into a store and you can buy something without even getting, I mean, you can buy something from a distance of two meters by simply aiming your phone to a QR code and buying. Um, I was actually in Israel during the very first part of the uh, first wave and we were locked down, but everyone was allowed to go to the store to buy food. And of course the stores ended up being hubs. The, at that time there weren't any masks available. So the people, no one was wearing a mask. Not only that, the Perspex shields that have now been used in many stores weren't up and you had to pay with a credit card or money. So you could immediately see that if one infected person who came to the same store could infect everyone else. And I think that you know, the other thing is how do you actually test whether somebody is maybe getting sick? And this is something which China still does all the time. People are expected to take their temperature and report the result online. Uh, and it's not by a fancy digital thermometer. Uh, when we did quarantine here, we were given a mercury thermometer. You can probably buy them for 50 pence each or something like that in bulk. It hurts your arm to shake them down, but you do it. And you know, take your temperature and report it. And by looking at morning temperatures and evening temperatures, they can actually see whether a person is sickening of something. So again, this is a way, and apparently in New York City, uh, there were a small number of automatic temperature thermometers on, in a network, and they actually peaked well before mm. everything peaked. So I think the thing is to be early, but it isn't enough. You have to be early and smart. So I think what you can do with COVID is detect early, and then you can close areas off. Uh, you know, in other words, I don't think locking down schools and keeping people at home is necessarily the right thing, but stopping the trains leaving London to go to Manchester probably would be a good idea. In the New York case, there were flights from New York City to the West Coast every single day of the pandemic. Uh, and those long distance connections, you know, inside New York City, everyone's infected. So you're not gonna gain a whole lot by tight locking people down. Closing down neighborhoods would be a good idea. Um, so I think that, uh, and, and a lot of this is actually backed theoretically, we've been modeling the pandemic and it turns out that these long connections, these, these hubs are the key. Uh, if everyone only knew, knew through other people, you'd, this would never spread. You've got to have people who, as shop owners or bus drivers or whatever, meet lots of people. Um, so I think we thought on the one hand that we were too powerful. We thought we could do contact tracing. Trouble with contact tracing is, is that you catch COVID, it's now been repeated increasingly a number of times through the air. And the SARS 2003 was a disease you caught by physical contact. But catching something through the air is a bit like, you know, using Bluetooth or Wi-Fi rather than a wire. If you catch it by contact, it's like using a wire, you know you've got it. So I think we were spreading this much more quickly. Uh, maybe shutting down the, the subways would have been a good idea. I think the other problem is, is that in our society, uh, maybe 80% of the people could work from home but we still had people having to come in. We still had people having to do these things. And those people should have been the people to be, to be monitored by thermometers, by masks should have gone to, you know, and, and uh, so I think there are things you could have done. Uh, and these things are not dramatically different uh, from, from the things that were done, but they would have been more focused. Again, it's also important to realize <clears throat> You don't have to close, you don't have to shut a city hermetically. With all these things, immunology, if you get things, if you know, you cut something down 
it's 10% of its previous level, that's as good as nothing. So you never have to immunize everybody. You never have to stop all the travel. It's just, you need to basically identify super spreader events, maybe certain football games or rock concerts and things like that. Um, I think also given that COVID is spread essentially by speaking through the air, um, having people speak loudly in noisy environments is probably a bad idea. So for example, maybe instead of closing the pubs, just to simply turn off all the music in pubs. Uh, or, or clever, in other words, there are clever things you can do that are less draconian, that would be more accepted, um, but are smart. So I actually think we really need to be smart in this. And unfortunately, um, you know, what bothers me here is, is that a lot of scientists didn't want to think this way. They wanted to cast a very draconian shadow. And I argued with many of the British scientists about this in June, in, in March, saying essentially that COVID was gonna have a risk of around a month rather than a year. And when we now look back, the average excess death in all the countries through which we have the data is almost exactly 8% and 8% is a month out of a year. Um, so again, the data was there. It was just this unwillingness to really think out of the box. Mm. Yeah, so um, without returning to the excess death issue, I, I very much agree with you about um, the neighborhood approach. And I think um, in terms of UK learnings, I think um, our, our um, limited investment in public health, as we call it, uh, was exposed. And we, we disinvested in public health facilities and public health experts are the people who should be coming up with the measures you're describing. And, and, and they are. Uh, regionally. Um, so what happened in the UK was there was far too much central command and control, in my view, which led to these um, national uh, edicts rather than tailored local edicts. Um, the other thing is diagnostics. I mean, what, what any reflections on that? Because I think one of the limitations, again, in the UK was that our capacity for wide, wide scale testing was very limited at the beginning. And I think that was one thing Germany was much, much better placed at because they had really good partnerships between diagnostics industries and diagnostic healthcare. Yeah, so I, you know, I think testing, the trouble is, is that if there are people who are, you know, not, well, it depends, you know, let's say I get tested today, but am I infectious tomorrow? And my guess is you could be. Uh, the other thing about the testing is, is that uh, certainly in the latest stages of COVID is that the tests are so sensitive that if you had COVID two months ago, you could still be carrying the messenger RNA. Um, so I think, you know, for me, I was never, I think taking temperatures would have been, I, I have no idea why it wasn't done. I mean, it, it would be so easy uh, to simply say, would well, you know, please stay at home, uh, take your temperature every day, put it into, you know, no, maybe no one even reads it. Uh, and, uh, you know, have food delivery. I mean, simply uh, pay for free food for people who stay at home. I mean, it would be cheap to do that by far. People would not be going to stores um, and you know, pay for the stores to stay closed. Um, I, the diagnostics worry me. It's now been shown that PCR polymerized chain reaction done with high cycle thresholds uh, are detecting people who have the virus on them, or at least some of the RNA, but are not really infectious. I think the key thing is to detect infectious people. And I'm not sure if we really can do that. I remember. Uh, Quite early on, uh, I visited China actually previously in September last year, and I was actually in uh, one of the key hospitals in Wuhan. And the person said to me, he sort of took me to the side, he said, you know, we never use PCR. We use chest CT. Because a chest CT is a clinical diagnosis. And, it, you know, it, the, the, I would love someone to do with some, you were talking before how the U UK had planned for flu. I would love somebody to do a simulation of flu where we're testing flu with PCR just like we're testing COVID and then saying that anyone who had flu within the last 28 days was a flu death. My guess is the flu death numbers would be way higher than mm. we currently see. So I think, you know, we, we, you know, I think that maybe a quick test, you, you know, I remember at, at some point we were talking about how difficult it is for people in old age homes they don't have many years left to life and they're, they're in isolation so let's say i'm in an old age home and my granddaughter wants to visit me i don't actually have a grand 
I do have a granddaughter, I guess I do, then she would take a test. Mm -hmm. And if that test was negative and I didn't mind, I would see her. Mm -hmm. So there are things like that that could be done. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I worry about the amount of money that was placed on uh, testing as well as track and trace. Uh, all the countries that were very high on track and trace quickly stopped. Um, uh, it doesn't work because of, you know, in, in some ways, what I would probably do is actually the opposite. And we actually asked people in Israel to do this. We ended up having some very high level discussions in Israel in March. Just test randomly. Don't track and taste, just test randomly. And maybe you can pick up local regions where the virus is emerging. No, well, you, I mean, that's, I think, been a very, very powerful uh, addition in the UK. It was slow to happen, but the Office for National Statistics now does exactly what you're saying, random testing. And then there's also an imperial based study. Um, and that is what has allowed us to understand actually what's happening. I mean, if you don't do that, you honestly don't know because a significant fraction of infections, as you know, are asymptomatic. So, no, that has been very, very informative. Um, there's some questions starting to come in from the audience. So um, I'll come to some of those in a minute. I just wanted to run one thing past you that I didn't know until I was preparing for this conversation. And maybe you didn't know. Isaac Newton uh, made one or two important observations. Um, and, and one um, actually came during a pandemic when he was forced to work from home in 1665 because of the plague. Um, do you think there's any sort of scientific benefits or breakthroughs that have happened during this pandemic that we can um, quote in the future in a way that we can now quote Newton? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I would say in my own case, I, I was working with a team that involved one person in Shanghai and three people in California, and we were spread over the globe in such a way that any kind of even Zoom meetings were impossible. And we retrospectively realized that if we had been able to get around a blackboard and just talk randomly, we would have solved the problem months earlier. So I think that one thing, I was always somebody who loved to work at home. Anyone will tell you that in my lab, I only came in for social events. I was always at home. And I suddenly realized that uh, we are made much, much more intelligent by interaction with other people. Yeah. And, you know, maybe Isaac Newton could do it by himself. Maybe he was puzzling a, a tough mathematical problem. Um, but I actually find that, uh, you know, even random people just saying, oh, that, that last point is wrong, even if they don't know what you're talking about, you'll go to the last point you know, and say, gee, yeah, they were right, there's something wrong. Because basically, in any new work, there are errors everywhere. So I actually think that... Uh, you know, it's been interesting, for example, that uh, these uh, distance learning, these, these Zoom schooling don't seem to work very well. And uh, I was a great lover of distance learning, but I've now become, you know, I just want to see people. So uh, yeah. it, it's interesting that conferences now are actually not letting people come virtually uh, just to try to get back yeah. Uh, yeah. to reality. Yeah. Yeah, no, I do agree with you. Okay, well, look, uh, I'd love to carry on and ask you questions, but uh, there's some, I want to do justice to the audience and, and I'm just Thanks. going to read one or two. So this is the first one I'm going to give you is from a, a physics alumnus, so uh, that's appropriate. Uh, Ray Symes, um, follow the science, uh, he says, has been much used during the pandemic, yet scientists can only come up with probabilities generated by models and so on. The concept of risk management is hardly understood by lay people, including politicians. Uh, who subsequently acted too late or relaxed rules too early. How have, sci have scientists failed to explain that following the science still needs risk-based political decisions? So I agree completely that evaluating risk, firstly, people are really bad at it. We, I mean, you know, if somebody says, what's the risk of going to the, going to the sea or, or sitting in California, you'll probably say it's the sharks and, the, uh, and drowning, but the reality is it's the hot dogs and the sun. Uh, so we're very, very unable to evaluate risk. I think we, again, you know, the news people were saying a thousand have died here. Instead of saying that in England normally and every day we have, I don't know what the number is, is it five or 6,000 people uh, die a week in England? I, again, I'm doing some talk in my head, maybe 10,000 a week. Um, but, you know, say that this week we had 2% more, 5% more, give, give context. Uh, so I think that that has something we don't know how to do very well. And I have a pine that maybe machine learning is the way to do this, Everyone has said that they will get rid of the people very quickly when the machines take over. So I'm not sure that's the situation. But I do think that for me, the big fault of scientists was shutting down communications. 
Mm. Um, you know, I tried very hard to engage many of the very well-known scientists in, in England, other than being told I was wrong and I'm not an epidemiologist, that was it. And that's fine. You know, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I wasn't wrong, they were wrong. So I think that it's important that we have discussion, we engage, it, 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 things became very, very uncivil. Um, I would say that the uh, most uh, virulent, uh, unpleasant uh, countering that I've had on Twitter has been by my colleagues, people in the same area as mine, essentially people in the area that I founded. Uh, and I, I think, I don't think it was anything personal. I just think they were very scared and they didn't want anyone to say anything you know, that might make things worse. Uh, I think also, unfortunately, most scientists can work from home. In fact, for a, a theoretical scientist, working from home is like having a vacation. You know, you can, it, everything is easy. You can keep on thinking like Isaac Newton. The trouble is, is that is this completely neglects the people who have lost their livelihood, have to come in and work in hospitals or work in groceries and things like this. So I, I felt it was a very selfish approach. Uh, I think we need, to ensure communication because basically hard problems you know need to be looked at by everyone i, I keep on remembering uh, richard Feynman when he took the o-ring put it in a glass of water and broke and showed that the engineering on i think the challenger or one of the uh, apollo things had been faulty and, and you know great scientists working on this you know one thing about a computer programmer is that you learn that you are wrong all the time. Because basically when you, you know, if there's an error in your program and I still program, no one put it there. It wasn't like, gee, your wife came along and tried to trick you by moving your glasses. No, if there's an error there, it's you. And you made an error and you have to accept that. And I think it's a very important thing to realize. In fact, when I give lectures in Chinese, I, we're not in China, in China, I can't speak Chinese. I tell them that a good scientist is wrong 90% of the time, but a really great scientist is wrong 99% of the time. They say, oh, how can it be? I say, well, you know, if you aren't wrong, you aren't doing difficult things. I mean, you know, if you're on the boundary of a subject and if you're right all the time, you know, try harder things. So yeah. I think that being wrong is perfectly fine. Yeah, no, very important point. Uh, I, uh, I hosted a, a press conference with um, two prominent people in the UK pandemic, uh, Patrick Vallance, the government chief scientist, and Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer. And I was, I was very impressed that they said, look, we don't know all the answers. Um, there is no single answer, in fact, but debate and, and getting different views is really important. So uh, I think uh, you're dead right. Um, very different question from KK Tan. Um, through the years, you, Michael, have studied almost all the key aspects of science, maths, physics, biology, chemistry. Among all these diverse fields, do you think there's one that binds them all? And if so, which? So this is a very general scientific philosophy. Yeah, philosophy. so, uh, you know, I really, I, if, for a quick answer, I would say yes, physics. And the reason is, is that for me, physics is advanced common sense. Uh, and again, you know, it, 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 this just goes back to always finding a base level, always trying to have a reference in, in things. So I think that, uh, I, I would say in some ways, you know, it, it, logic is probably the one that really binds everything because logic is, is you know, if something is too good to be true, it isn't true. And uh, if something is too bad to be true, it probably also isn't true. So I, 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 something that I quoted a lot of times in, in various interviews was uh, Socrates saying, listen to your common sense rather than what people tell you. And I think this applies and sadly to all the newspapers I have seen, I mean, if, if I wanted to compile a, a list of really atrocious uh, articles. I could take them from the Guardian or the New York Times or the London Times. They are filled of articles that should really be covering, you know, the hall of shame of, of how people have thought about these things. And, you know, and again, anyone with a little bit of physics thinking would have said, well, gee, they've, for example, one that I remember, when the United States got to 100,000 COVID deaths, they put all the names of the people on the front page of the New York Times. And I thought that isn't really fair because in the same time, 700,000 people have died from non-COVID deaths. And you know, were those deaths any less valuable? Were these people out there in the front lines like a soldier fighting against COVID? No, they were just unlucky that their death happened to be, or maybe lucky, for their death happened to be classified as a COVID death. So that's something which neglects the background. So I think that uh, I always had, a, you know, I remember very early on, I was actually on a 
Fox, my, my only appearance on Fox TV. Mm-hmm. And Laura Ingraham, uh, you know, basically said, what message did I have for them? And I said, just be, use common sense. You know, don't uh, try to think in an in a all-encompassing common sense way. But then people have told me that common sense is the least common sense we have. So what can I say? But I think, all, you know, all the scientists have their role. And I actually... Um, essentially sorted out in mathematics, physics, then chemistry, and probably now biology. I would say I'm probably more a biologist, but a computer programming biologist. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one thing, um, one thing that we haven't touched on very much, um, but, but I, I hope you'd accept, because um, you're, you're right, calculating COVID-caused deaths and excess deaths is a complicated uh, task um, and, and, and fraught with uh, errors. Um, what I think, uh, unfortunately, will turn out to be true, we, we, we won't know the COVID-related death toll, even in a country like the UK that hopefully is emerging, for a couple of years, because the dominant effect of COVID was to dominate the hospital setting. And the consequence of that was that an awful lot of routine activity was displaced. And so cancer waiting times are, you know, have gone off the scale. And so I think... Um, and the NHS is going to have a huge task to try to recover from all of that. So I think it's, it's a very complicated uh, topic, but I, I think uh, I completely agree with you that, and I do get irritated with the BBC, who every day put up the total number of COVID-related yeah. deaths. I don't know why they do that, actually. because They, they weren't alone. They, uh, CNN in Israel, I mean, every yeah. place I listened to yeah. was doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, okay, let's take uh, another one from uh, Ramesses Struka Boudier, and I apologize, I'm not pronounced your name very well. Uh, Do you think that the successful response with vaccination affects the public's perception of scientific credibility in areas such as genetic engineering? And do you think this will have consequences? I assume they mean positive, e.g. relaxing the rules around CRISPR in agricultural innovation, I mean, GM crops. I mean, there's there's a whole lot of areas where you know, I, I think, so I was, I did some very early work in, in the late 60s on RNA and RNA structure. And, you know, seeing that RNA is able to elicit an immune response and be administered uh, really, uh, I think, is potentially a very, very exciting development. Um, I've actually been vaccinated three times, not because I think three is a good number, but I wanted to get two vaccinations in the same jurisdiction. Uh, so I ended up being vaccinated once in Israel, and then when I moved to America, they wouldn't recognize the Israeli vaccine, so I had two more. Uh, and, you know, I've said publicly that I don't think the risk, I don't know what the risk of vaccination is, but I explained to them that at my age, the risk of dying is a quarter percent a month, and I'm quite sure that the vaccination risk is way less than, you know, a day. So, but every, we have risks. I mean, we have a risk of sliding and slipping in the bath or cutting our fingers, so life is full of risks. We die of life. Um, so I think, uh, and if, this, if these RNA viruses do turn out to have no long-term effect, and we don't know yet because they've only been administered for five or six months. Um, and again, we, the AstraZeneca, I mean, there's been a lot of very clever virus technology uh, in there. But again, these viruses, uh, in previous epidemics, the viruses were never released until it was too late. Mm. Uh, so I do hope that there isn't uh, any sudden negative uh, reaction to the virus as I've looked, I, you know, it can't be very negative. Uh, I often, often tell people that if something is very clear, you don't have to test it very much. So jumping off a 10 story building, you could probably do one or two tests and you'd realize it wasn't a good idea. Uh, whereas if something is very mild, you have to test it much, much more. And again, the risk from the viruses is, from the vaccines is small. Uh, so I think vaccines and the, these, you know, the new novel vaccines that can be developed so quickly could be very exciting. And there, there are other coronaviruses out there that causes a great deal of damage, like common colds. Uh, maybe a better flu vaccine would be a good idea. Um, but again, um, what is worrying is the uh, compulsory aspect of vaccination. I, I just heard that uh, Stanford University is now insisting on vaccinations for all. And, you know, I think that uh, somehow I, you know, Maybe, maybe no. I, I just find that a lot of people take uh, exception to be enforced to do something. Um, again, as a joke, I tell people that if a vaccine can save me about one day of bureaucracy, 
like getting a visa, it's probably worth doing. And I told people that I had three in my left arm from Pfizer. I'm happy to have two Chinese in this arm if it avoids quarantine. Um, I don't think there is a real imminent risk, uh, uh, but we don't know. And I really hope and pray that we won't discover some serious long-term risk. Whether this should open up the gateway to, uh, well, if you're gonna genetically engineer uh, food, I think that's a totally separate issue. Uh, I would be very happy if the opposition to, gen to GMOs was reduced by these vaccines. I didn't actually see the connection, but that would be great because I do think that uh, nothing kills more than starvation. I mean, it, you know, you, you die after a few days. Uh, so uh, I think that again, it's very easy to be in a rich country where you can afford organically grown everything and say, well, we shouldn't have golden rice elsewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, it could well be that these viruses, whether it's the uh, DNA virus, uh, the adenovirus in, in, in Oxford or the various RNA viruses, they could end up being a major new advance in vaccine technology. And that would be wonderful if they screw up there could be a major step backwards. And my fingers are crossed, hoping that it'll be fine. Absolutely. Well, look, I think that's a positive note to end on. There are many other questions that are coming from the audience. I apologize we didn't cover all of those. And thank you, Michael, for a really fascinating conversation. And thank you for your thank time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure, Megan, if I'm handing back to you uh, to sign us off or... I think, I think you're handing over uh, to me. To you for me, I beg your pardon. Yes, uh, Robert. No, I, I think that was... Um, excellent. I cannot thank you both um, for your thought-provoking conversation. The rest of us who are not natural sci scientists always come across like lay people. Uh, the accessibility of the conversation uh, and actually the fact that you were both uh, you were able to delve into some of the most uh, important concerns for every ordinary citizen. Uh, of the world, of the UK at this point in time, makes this really meaningful uh, indeed. I think it's clear that, you know, issues around uh, early action, um, extending the range of indicators to help us make decisions, um, the fact that really there are lessons we need to learn for the future, uh, the fact that we will be doing this again, uh, some, we might be doing this again sometime in the future. These are cold hard facts uh, that I think everyone listening to you uh, has uh, been ab absorbing. And the questions also uh, from our alumni uh, that we've seen uh, you discuss and others really give us uh, an indication of the extent of interest. Uh, in this uh, in this subject at this time in the world. I want to thank you so very much. I want to thank our alumni uh, and students for joining us. We look forward to hosting you uh, at another alumni and university event in the future. And in the meantime, please look forward to an email, as I said earlier, uh, following today's event to find out more about how to get involved. Thank you so very much. Thanks. Thank you very much and bye. Bye. bye.